All right, so we'll unofficially have a meeting. We had on August 3rd, that's mm. today, if we were to follow the plan, which I talked to Sarah yesterday and our intent is to keep going, uh, water quality protection and shoreline lighting guidelines. And shoreline what? Guidelines. Sure, it's completely off. <laughs> So Kathy I, sits, I just had a question about mm -hmm. Kathy sits as our representative on the watershed council. Yeah. Okay. The watershed council, right. Okay. Yeah. So there's a watershed council, the watershed association. association. So as the uh, chief elected hey, official, yeah. she sits as our representative on the watershed council. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, that would be yeah. after the year, and then it's up to the board, whoever mm -hmm. they want to appoint, um, to be our representative on the watershed council. Right. So Canandaigua Lake Protection, if I can just jump in here and help you a second. So obviously, I think everybody's aware we've done two Sucker Brook stormwater quality improvement projects, one out here on 5 and 20, uh, one on um, County Road 30. Actually, would you mind going, I did a presentation at the, is it the July town board meeting? Or was it the June town board? It was just recent. July. It was the, it was the July. Yeah, yeah. Was. Can you just pull up those photos so that the people that went? Oh, there, those were good. Yeah. Do you know how things? Town board agenda. Was, it was for July. And then July. Yeah. And then DF presentation. But um, so we did. So originally we identified uh, working with Kevin O'Brien and Canada Lake Watershed mm -hmm. Council. We identified eight uh, stormwater quality improvement projects for Sucker Brook. Uh, so we've completed two of the eight. So there's six remaining. Um, there's any number of them that we've looked at over the years. But even with the two yes. that were uh, recently yeah. completed, you see here in the photos, actually, that's it. Right there. Right. Um, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Second, so we can show you this. Um, so there was a, uh, with that storm event that we had, there was a significant uh, reduction in the flooding that came, would normally come through the city and come over to Outhouse Park and, and everything associated with that. Um, we also have, we have money in our capital fund to do additional Suckerbrook stormwater quality improvements. There's actually some grant money available and the uh, federal money that the town just got, uh, one of the eligible projects is stormwater uh, management, stormwater control, those types of things. Um, so there's an opportunity, and Kevin had just emailed me just this week about um, maybe moving forward with, with one of the, the projects associated with that. Okay. So, right. So we had a storm event on July 18th. And so the... Um, Let's just skip the screen for a second. So this is talking about Sucker Brook. Sucker Brook, I think everybody here knows, but I had, was showing them Sucker Brook covers a big chunk of the town of Canandaigua before it turns and goes back through the city and then comes back into mm. Canandaigua Lake. Um, it travels north and then turns and then goes south. It's a very unique stream that uh, was identified as one of the major pollutant loads into Canandaigua Lake. If you can go to the next. Um, and then these are those eight locations of the stormwater quality improvement projects. So we completed uh, over a three year period, the city and town each contributed money uh, into a capital project for us to work on these uh, projects. Um, and then if you go to the next screen, I believe we completed uh, the one on County Road 30. And then uh, the next screen that might show the one, oh, okay, I don't remember what the next screens are. So clearly this is, from May 16, 2014, this is Outhouse Park. Mm. Go ahead. It's still the same rain event. This is uh, July 23rd, 2017. You can see the water all up around the bocce ball courts at Outhouse Park. You can also see this picture is uh, a basement in the city of Canandaigua that's flooded mm. uh, because that was a normal occurrence with the Sucker Brook uh, overflowing at, during these big rain events. Go ahead. So same, same event. And then July 18, 2021, 
our stormwater quality improvement projects are working. They're holding the water back, holding the flooding back. Uh, there's a little bit of an issue with this one. This is the County Road 31. Um, I think we're going to have to make a major, minor modification to the weir structure. Go ahead to the next screen. Um, and then this is the 5 and 20 project, and you can see the big chunk there. Uh, Wanda Colosini uh, gave us easements there, and Dave Sauter. Um, there's, there was quite a bit of water in this project. Go ahead. and um, This is July 18, 2021. That thing is completely full of water, and the wetlands on the other side of it is completely full of water. So it's all being held back uh, in those two. This water quality improvement project in particular. Jim, some of your guns. If we had rain events, like I, I'm searching to come up with when, but it was four or five years ago where we had those monstrous. So the July something comparable. So the July seventeenth event was very similar. Good. Uh, very very similar. It's not quite as much, but it was very similar in in the scope of it and um, of those other events. And our stormwater quality improvement project didn't have water in it to the extent that it does in this photo. Uh, so it really did work and really filled up. Um, and the other nice thing about that is right, it's holding the sediment back, it's holding the silt back, it's holding back the things that are running off of the fields and everything in these uh, water quality. And it, it was actually evident where Sucker Brook goes into a lake because mm -hmm. I spent a lot of time down there. Mm -hmm. And usually during rain events, you can see the distinct change in yeah. color of the water all the way over to the golf course. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. this time it was, it was narrowed. You know, you could see it coming out and it was over to Squaw Island, but it didn't even go all the way in front of the city pier, which is significant, mm -hmm. really significant. Yeah. So we, Doug, we when, when you're talking project mm -hmm. on this, um, it's mainly retention in a different area to hold it all back? Right, it, so it, these, on the screen here, you see the green circles. So those are the six that are not completed yet. The two with the X's have been completed. So the, the idea is that the during these flooding events, when the majority of this rain would come, there's weir structures that as the water crests the structure, it short circuits into these retention areas and the water is held back. Hmm. So the 5 and 20 project right up the street here, that's designed so that that can accommodate water for a longer period of time. The one on County Road 30 had to be designed so that it doesn't hold water for any longer than 24 hours oh. because of the airport. We oh. can't have sitting water, which would attract birds and any number of different things at the edge of the runway to the airport. So we had to actually design it and engineer it so the water would go in there, would short circuit and go in there, but then it would drain out. We even had to plant special grasses and stuff in there to make this all work. Uh, and then it would let back into Sucker Brook and then work its way back. But these other areas still exist. These other six areas that were previously identified that, you know, there's still an opportunity to move forward with these. Um, any number of them have a number of different issues why they have not been constructed to this point. Um, you know, easements, landowners, whether or not they're willing to give us easements, whether or not they're willing to sell easements. Um, area F is the area that is right out here along the bypass. It is, uh, if you go to the right, right up here at the traffic light, and then down as you're going oh. on the bypass, it's on the right-hand side. That's a low point. And area E is very close to it. Area E is right across the street from Miller Park. So area E becomes a very interesting uh, potential location to do one of these projects because there's a significant amount of runoff that could go into area E that's identified on the map. It could also serve as a point of connection for us to connect what will be the Auburn Trail to the Town Hall campus, connecting the Town Hall campus to Miller Park, mm -hmm. which would then tie into Outhouse Park, Blue Heron Park, and we really talk about the, the trail connection pieces. Um, there's definitely a component there. And then obviously with area E, that's also across the street from the new proposed uh, Morel Wilkin project, which also has stormwater in it that we originally did, were not planning to do, but uh, the Morels are willing and they're actually working with Kevin 
to do something a little different with the wetlands to try to capture some of that in that open space mm -hmm. and then have those trails that go around. Is, that, is yeah. the area E. Jen Miller's land or not? No, it's the, it's the, it's, it's where there was a one point a gentleman had proposed building apartments. It's like next to uh, DePaul. Right okay. there, horizons. Now, there's a stream that goes through that lot that's to the east, you know, the where the Morel project mm -hmm. was is mm -hmm. away. Right. And that stream flows north, right? Right. That's across this, the road. That's this okay, area. That's, east. The spot. Okay. that's the spot, right? That is the spot. Okay. Where where does that water originate? Just run off. And just, Parish just Street? Right yeah, so it's Parish Street, Street extension. That whole area. Well, you can see the Blue Line stream. I mean, it kind of like that's the thing about Sucker Brook. It's so unique in that it flows into Sucker Brook in so many different spots. It captures runoff and then it all feeds into Sucker Brook before that main artery gets up there to the County Road 30 project and then turns and it goes mm -hmm. south again. Well, I wonder if there are still suckers in Sucker Brook. <laughs> when we were kids, everybody lived on Park Avenue and down in those neighborhoods. In the spring, they'd go spearing suckers. Oh, That's yeah. how they got their name. Yeah. They're so, ugly fish with big sucker mouths. Yeah. So, I, I don't know if you're old enough to remember this, but is Sucker Brook, was it a man-made no, waterway or was it a natural waterway? I'm sure yeah. it was channeled through the city of Canandaigua yeah. that channel, right. channelized it. Well, um, and then Chuck, I mean, feel free to jump in here as our former chair of our drainage committee, which is my understanding we're combining that with public works committee, but people don't complain until there's a flooding issue. So the good news is we're we're making progress, but we need to kind of finish, right? But nobody's talking about it because nobody's having an issue. Yeah, we've been lucky. Yeah, you're right, Doug. It, uh, when it comes to the top of the, uh, the priority chart, then people tend to, uh, to bring it to our attention. Uh, I will say regarding that uh, July uh, 18th, uh, event that was almost four years to the day from the the big storm that i uh, sort of created the uh, drainage advisory committee mm -hmm. and uh, i was driving around looking at some of the uh, probably five or six uh hot spots that we had on our uh list of uh, potential uh problem areas and they all seemed good and uh, i checked with jim fletcher after the storm the following monday and he said that was, uh, he didn't get any calls. And I assume the town board members didn't get any calls. Uh, to the credit of the county, uh, we the drainage advisory committee had worked with the uh, county uh, public works department and they went out and did a, a hydraulic study of uh, County Route 16, which is where a lot of our problems were. And uh, they did some actual replacement of pipes. They cleaned out some gutters. Uh, these were all things that we had brought to their attention that seemed they were either undersized pipes or pipes that had become filled with debris and uh, and opened some gutters up. I know right across the street from Oksana, uh, they did a uh, they had a griddle out there for about two days, opening that up in front of RSM. So I think that all contributed to the improvements we saw uh, last month. So uh, as you said, Doug, good news on that front. Yeah. And then we did the uh, joint project, Town of Canandaigua, City of Canandaigua, Finger Lakes Community College, the county. Yeah. Uh, the Gorham was all involved in that. And there's a large improvement over there uh, on State Route 364, which also helps significantly for the east side of the lake, which, um, you know, I, I know as I was putting this presentation together, I found photos of County Road 18 and all of that. And, the water up over my running board on my pickup truck, uh, sitting right that. on County Road 18. That. Wow, so. people had, they were shoveling out their garage, <laughs> garages. Yeah, yeah. We took a ride back down. Yeah, and I think Doug. I, th I, th I think Doug that that was a result of a a pipe becoming uh, clogged up on County yes. Road 18. Most of that problem. Yes. 
Yeah. Uh, and while we're on that side of the lake, also the uh, the work that was done on the uh, community college property uh, with the uh, uh, canoe, what's they call the canoe pond, where they yes. build up the berms and put more storage into the pond. That certainly helped the mm. east side uh, with a lot of the problems that we had on our hit list uh, uh, regarding flooding. Right. So uh, that 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 helped the east side of the lake anyway. Yeah, that, that's the one. That's exactly the one I'm talking about, Chuck. That was a major project. And then, you know, a lot of times, <laughs> I'll, I'll throw it out there, a lot of times it gets negative publicity, but Dave Janeko really enabled that project to move forward and work because he owns the property and gave easements to allow all of that to happen and even get to that area and everything else that otherwise we wouldn't have had any access to do any of that work. And uh, he uh, donated all of those easements um, associated with that. Yeah, he gets a lot of bad publicity, so it's good to give him an attaboy publicly. So, you know, there's obviously a lot that can be done that falls under this category of Canandaigua Lake protection. Um, but these are these are examples of where we've seen a significant difference, improvement in things that we have directly done. But there's more work to be done. How about farming practices adjacent to these runoffs? Well, the good news is, right, that's one of the things about it having these to housing projects and span <laughs> <laughs> well, but but now we're actually capturing right the sediment, so now we can clean. It's a lot easier to clean out of a stormwater management area than it is out of the lake. <laughs> so, what project would? And Tom, you know that uh, next. Would... Go ahead. Go ahead, Sal. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say, Tom knows uh, that with each site plan approval down along the storm water management, both quantity and quality of, of management. So the rain gardens are becoming the norm on all projects. And uh, that certainly, uh, I think, helped also. Every little bit cumulatively, yeah. as Kevin will tell us. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, Sal, go ahead. No, I was just looking, looking at the map. What would be next? Yeah, great, great question, Sal. I think that um, the area around area E was one of the areas that um, Kevin had identified um, as a particular uh, opportunity for improvement. Um, either Area E, which we have not been able to get an easement on, or perhaps that Miller uh, Wilkin project, which is the same stream corridor essentially. Uh, Kevin Albany and I, um, before COVID, had met with the new owner of that property and we explored trying to get an easement donation, obviously, at first. Um, there was no interest in that. Um, ask about the potential to maybe purchase an easement, a uh, little to no interest in that. Um, their interest was either in selling the whole property to the town or, you know, and that, that happens quite often. I'm dealing with that on another issue right now where we need an easement for the Auburn Trail and they're saying just buy the whole property. And, and so mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, uh, that's challenging sometimes. And, and uh, so I think area E is probably one of those areas where I think, uh, generally speaking, maybe it's not that specific location, where but that, that's where the, I see it down there, but I don't can't. So that's uh, essentially County Road 32 on the north side of County Road 32. Okay. I know what I mean. Yeah. Um, I think those areas in particular would be of interest. Area D and A are fairly significant, large projects that would include uh and what what kevin and then even the group from hobart and william smith college had done but uh, kevin uh, really gets all the credit on on this is um they identified these areas and where it would be the um, most lucrative to construct these because they're already naturally low areas and trying to take advantage of wetlands that's already there mm -hmm. and essentially designing these to 
go ahead and flood the wetlands during those events uh, to serve as the protection piece and then letting the water go out from there or adjacent to wetlands, naturally low spots to minimize the construction. But um, in particular, I think it's area A um, may perhaps impact an agricultural farm field if there and area D, I think, did the same. So uh, there was some resistance, I think, in those two, those two spots. But It's nice when we have a willing developer, um, like the stuff that we're doing on with morale right now, uh, that helps go a long way. And we still have money in this capital project for these projects too, so. Area B, if I'm envisioning it correctly, they just spread liquid manure on that like a week or two ago. So, oh, that's and, good. Yeah, they had a big tank truck. And then offloading it and spraying it on. Which, if you get rain at the right time, is probably not very good. Mm -hmm. Well, as you know, those are some of the challenges. Yeah. Uh, that property that we've had many issues with over the years on Paris Street Extension, the south side of Paris Street Extension, yeah. that drains down into... Yeah. A stormwater pond that then, or not a stormwater pond, it drains down into somebody's pond on their private property, and then a blue line stream, which discharges into the lake next to Jim Freelich's old house. Yeah, yeah. Sixteen. So yeah. we yeah, got a lot of we'll, silt we'll runoff. We'll yeah. We had a lot of runoff from the parcel, and then still farmed, and it's still farmed the wrong way. The wrong way. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you wish sometimes people would move into the 21st century, 22nd century? Well, I would think that aren't, aren't there are people out there that enforce good farming practices, you know, the contours going with it, mm -hmm. following with the contours. There's yes. groups that encourage it and there's groups that reward it, but I don't know if there's a lot of people specifically looking for problems. These right, right to farm laws are. And we do have Good, some really responsible farmers in the town. Yeah. But not everybody follows best practices. I think more do now than they used to. There, is there anything that the Ag Committee can do specifically as a goal um, to work with farmers in regard to water quality issues, the kinds of things we're discussing now? I know that they have goals. There are goals from the comprehensive uh, enha or enhancement, or not comprehensive, but the Ag Enhancement Plan. And um, does the Ag Committee see this maybe as being one of a project for the, an upcoming year or something like that? It's something uh, we can talk to them about. I mean, I don't, I, if they thought it was a priority, I think it works similarly the way that the ECB does, you know, you could hold a workshop with the Soil and Water Conservation District or something. Sure, I mean, you know, they could I'm do educational stuff. It's, it's, you know, uh, I'm it's just wondering, calling all the farmers, I don't know what they could do other than just, you know, sharing information, which I'm sure they would agree with is a good idea. I mean, they're, you know, they, you, like you say, you've got partners with soil and water and, you know, even a cooperative extension, but, um, yeah. you know, there's partners there, but it, it's a, it's a project, you know, someone's got to get behind it and start to move it. And so I'm wondering if this is a goal that we could recommend to the Ag Committee uh, for their next year, that we are, you know, we're looking at water quality issues and this would be a place where they could play a major part. I think um, it should be discussed. I think, Joyce, it should be discussed. Uh, and absolutely. brought out the Canandaigua Lake um, services, a huge area with its water as a water source. Mm -hmm. And yeah. by polluting it, you know, we're destroying our own ability to live a healthful life. Right. And um, I, I am all, all for farm. I advocate for farmers, but I believe that farmers need to be responsible and need to be aware that even these farmers that are all the way up, uh, like on Route 31 and over there, 
that that is where Canandaigua water goes. And they still have to take responsibility for a very, very large area surrounding our lakes. You know, well, one this... of the things I noticed about our schedule, the CIC schedule for this year, is that we do not have an opportunity at any of our meetings to talk about egg issues. And one of the things I'm wondering that we should be talking about uh, from an imp implementation point of view is that the egg enhancement plan does have goals and strategies. And I don't think we're, I'm not really familiar with what the egg committee is doing to forward those strategies or goals from the egg enhancement plan. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it might be beneficial for us to think about that because we've never talked about, well, not never, rarely talk about, you know, how the Ag Committee sees itself implementing these a plan. Um, so just throwing that out is maybe something we, we just want to review from them to see what their plans are. Well, the Ag Committee, Joyce, uh, just uh, recently, last uh, Thursday, as a matter of fact, had a program along with the watershed uh, people to, you know, put on a program that uh, was devoted to the quality of water in the lake, and uh, it wasn't uh, attended uh, basically at all by the mm. public. I, I just attended, had a, a um, presentation on Canandaigua Lake as a source of water. Um, and it was done by a former water um, authority person in another, in another municipality. It was astounding, astounding how far our lake water services. I, I'm, I'm amazed and perhaps something like that would make an impression. I mean, it made an impression on me and I'm just an old person, you know? So, but it maybe it would make an impression on some of these younger farmers who are looking for new ways to um, service the community and, and uh, protect their community. I don't know if it's a younger farmers that you need to touch mm -hmm. because any farmer that's any good at all doesn't want their topsoil in the exactly. way because it affects yeah. the yield on those crops. So most of the ones that are really uh, productive farmers are going to be addressing this problem on their own. To Most, yeah. not all. No, that's true. Right. Yeah. I guess, Gary, what, what I, I see here is it's not necessarily the, and, and it's great, you know, that the, pr the presentation that you guys had at the fair uh, for the general public, but it's about farmers themselves. You know, that's the, that's where the education is needed. And I don't know how much pressure or um, how the Ag Committee feels about, you know, marshalling our, our farmers and their um, education. I know it's it's kind of a tricky thing when you're talking about farmers who have been in this area for probably generations. But anyway, that's I'm just throwing that out. But also, I think that the CIC would benefit from supporting the Ag Committee. But we, first of all, we have to know what the Ag Committee is doing. And if it needs support from the CIC or from the town in any way to put forward the education of farmers, then, you know, we could do we could start something. You know, to your point, Karen, about uh, the impact of Canandaigua Lake, even just looking around this room, and I apologize for you, uh, those of you that are with us by Zoom, but this map back here has the watersheds, um, and you see what a huge the top one there with all the big bold colors and everything, oh, yeah. top left. Um, that's all the watersheds, and then right below it is our drainage districts, but the watersheds over there, and then I look at the map over here and look at the water distribution map, the one just to the left of the clock. That shows you all, and that's not even updated. There's an update coming, but that shows you all of the service area, even going to the north. Yes. That's all coming from Canada Lake. It is. It's huge area. Hmm. And the, the reason that, that I learned and I was surprised is the elevation. Mm -hmm. that can they will like even though we have all these hills around here we think it's like this in this gully well it's not mm -hmm. it's actually at a very high elevation compared to some of the areas north of here it is the elevation
<laughs> and well, I'll, this I'll salivation us. map here has 630 at the edge of the lake. Oh, wow. And I think that's pretty, I think that's pretty accurate. I was looking at Encore this morning at a piece of property that was uh, 680 right at the edge of the lake. So it's, you know. Interesting. Yeah, it's higher than you think. It is higher than you think. Yeah. Oh, because I know sometimes, like during the winter, going to be snowing where my house I'm 90 feet from like what's like road it's up there. It's raining down. It's, it's yeah. bizarre. It's bizarre. Yeah. Microclimates. Yeah. Yes, I know. Yeah. The trees start blooming earlier. There too. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. And also on our comprehensive uh, plan, why, why number four is to protect Canyon Lake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, and Joyce, um, to your point, you know, I agree that we don't talk about ACT very much in CIC. We left it to the ACT committee, but some communication between the two committees isn't a bad idea. And the mm -hmm. ACT committee has a meeting this Thursday. So, Gary, you know, we can try to remember and talk with them about yeah. that. And I'm sure they, you know, they, Sometimes they struggle with how best to, you know, get the word out. So, you know, and I'm looking at, at, at to the ECB as an example. You know, the workshops you guys had. You know, it's all about getting the information out there and then seeing if people, you know, are interested enough to show up. But, um, you know, they spoke at the fair, which isn't always well attended, no matter what we talk about at the fair. But, you know, maybe a separate event or a separate meeting or something, some sort of a workshop. I mean, they might be interested in that. Are there any um, uh, funding programs available for farmers to access for uh, protecting water quality uh, yes. that runs through there? Because yeah, that's some, also information soil that's, water yeah. Water yeah, soil water, water, water has an AEM, it's the uh, Agricultural Environmental Management Program, mm -hmm. and they can do things like, um, you know, work on catching runoff in like a basin planted grass. Um, they do help with the, one of the projects they did recently was at a dairy farm and baking manure and storage system, you know, retain it until they're ready to use it kind of thing. Um, so they, they've got programs and then there's the, I don't know if it's still effect or you know, if it's still active, excuse me, but they used to do the lake friendly farmers. Um, the White House Farm has that distinction. And there's another farmer in town was telling me about some other programs they used to be involved in that had to do with water quality. So there are incentives and there are programs. Um, I'm just not sure how many are still active and how many farmers were looking for it. Yeah. We've got a few projects that Soil and Water did in the town over the last several years, maybe five or ten years. So you know, maybe it's time to focus on uh, that type of education for the ag group. Gary will help you remember. I don't know off the top of my head what the other action steps were for the comp from the current comp for Canada Eagle Lake Protection. I mean, there's there's the goals yeah, right there, but that. I don't know what the action steps are off the top of my head. That's mm. probably something we should yeah, should have idea. looked at for this meeting. Yeah, we'll have to look it up. Yeah, I know a couple of years ago we kind of pivoted to let's support the other organizations. You know, let's support the council, the watershed council. Let's support the Watershed Association, and what was it, two years ago, they did their lake friendly, you know, lake friendly lawn care, is that what it's called? The little designation for the people who live in the watershed. Or is that the little circles? Yeah, the little lawn signs you can put in your yard. Um, and I, I think it was two years ago maybe that we did that. And then, you know, we shared it, we talked about it. We got an article in our newsletter about it and stuff like that. Um, but, you know, it was things like this. Those are really things that we can actually do to make an impact. But number three up there is ensure the protection of the town of Canandaigua's natural resources. And our greatest natural resource is Canandaigua Lake. Mm -hmm. 
So I, I, it actually does fit in with some of our goals. It's just not a specific goal. I think the next one. Right? It would show. Sure. Protect and I will like that's mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, goal three, the reason the only reason goal three is actually got a check mark, because obviously, you know, that's an ongoing thing to protect our natural resources. But I think the reason we had a check mark on that is because of our NRI. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Um but yeah, I, those things never will be checked off. Those are always gonna be things we have to work on. They should all be checked off. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you're not done. We're not done. Right. We are protecting the lake. We have a new update plan, too. Yeah. Which hopefully will be adopted at the August town board meeting. Right. So I'm thinking we need a new. Yeah. New we'll one. have to come up with a new uh, board. Folks, you know, another component uh, to this uh, uh, issue is the MS4 program. Uh, Chris has. Uh, a responsibility, Chris Jensen has a responsibility to uh, enforce the program and uh, part of that are procedures to ensure that uh, illegal discharges are monitored or found out and then uh, taken care of. Certainly uh, there's uh, the soil and erosion control that every project uh, must qualify for. And then there's the uh, stormwater maintenance agreement that has to be signed afterwards to ensure that what uh, stormwater controls are put into place are uh, continued once the project is closed out. So uh, yeah, that's certainly another component. I think that's probably helped contribute to uh, the improvements we've seen over the last couple of years. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, for sure, for sure, Chuck. Thanks for bringing that up. And um, even about three weeks ago, I know that Chris was out taking uh, photos of uh, uh, discharge points into the lake. Uh, we actually do that by boat. And uh, so actually, and the assessor is actually working on townwide rebound, which also requires photos from the boat. So uh, put the two of them together and they were out on a boat doing that one day. Um, that is something that's monitored. The, uh, the discharge points are all tracked uh, and monitored. Uh, Chris does that. And then we do an annual report to the DEC on what we're doing relative to MS4. And then um, anytime there's a big storm event, uh, we're out you know, looking. So July 18th, that's, that was a Sunday. Um, I was even out taking photos of different things and we saw there was like a washout across County Road 16 in two different spots. And mm -hmm. so we take photos of those and then go back and follow up with those landowners and, and uh, document that stuff. But uh, it's definitely um, that and even our stormwater management facilities in our housing developments, uh, our drainage districts, uh, those are all things associated with that also. And the cleaning out that we've done of Fox Ridge and Lakewood Meadows and, and all those drainage districts. I think we operate nine drainage districts, I believe, um, all very much factor into to all of that. So a lot of moving parts to that. Mm -hmm. It's probably related. Um, I've noticed the county is replacing a lot of culverts, at least at the south end of County Road 16, mm -hmm. and some monstrous ones and some just driveway ones. Yeah. I think a lot of that is the work that Chuck did and mm -hmm. calling out a lot of that and got the county's attention that they need to do some work. Mm -hmm. Slow <laughs> doing the hydro seeding one day, unfortunately. So I hope we don't get a downpour and wash all the nice topsoil that they brought in you know we were talking about agriculture one of the things that recently has come up and uh gary i don't remember if you and i had this conversation or not but um there actually is and i think it's something that we need to have some ongoing conversations about there is some uh, section of the town code that actually would require a farmer to get a permit and have a um essentially stormwater management plan for any time they're doing changes in their field relative to like drain tiles and stuff. Technically, technically, there's a portion of the code that would require them to get a building permit to actually install drain tiles, whether or not we want to go down that road, but it is there. It is in town code. And so we have had an issue recently where a farmer has made significant alterations to their property 
which has resulted in a discharge to a neighboring property that we're addressing through code enforcement. But it is something if we're, <clears throat> at least for a conversation, I bring it up, it's not mm -hmm. a popular topic, but, yeah. but you know, it is something yeah. to talk about. Can I hire another enforcement <laughs> officer? <laughs> Well, it, it, it speaks to the education of farmers. I mean, this is, could be a topic in a presentation uh, regarding that. Um, farmers, maybe they're not aware that they would, you know, come under the jurisdiction of, uh, you know, the CEO if when they're doing some major, or, or, and maybe they are, maybe they just disregard it. But anyway, having the town focus on it or consider a conversation regarding implementation of that code could be, a pretty interesting talk uh, for the farmers. Yeah, for sure. And, and you know, one of the things that we discovered through this recent situation that we had come up as we look, really dug into this and looked into it is there are some provisions that, uh, for instance, agriculture is exempt from building code. For instance, farmer wants to build a barn. He's exempt from any type of building permit or anything to build a barn. Uh, he's actually exempted by the New York State Property Maintenance Code, and it's actually spelled out as exemption for that. But when it comes to like soil erosion control, the exemption is not there. It's, it doesn't exist at the state level. Giving the authority back to the local municipality to regulate that or enforce that, interestingly enough. So. It actually doesn't make any sense, yeah. right? really. Good topic. A topic for farmers to discuss among themselves and see what they come up with as far as taking responsibility, you know. Yeah. I don't know if you guys talked about it before I came in, but um, then there's also, you know, the topic of fertilizer on lawns and, uh -huh. you know, I mean, anyone yeah. in any watershed who treats their lawn. There's more and more awareness, anyways. Mm -hmm. yeah. the signs that are up, you know. Yeah, like in Atwater, they've got the yeah. big sign. Yeah. Well, the city is having a problem with that right now, right? What was in the paper? Yeah. Because we haven't talked about shrubland guidelines. I think those have a topic for today. Yeah. I tried to find it to attach it to the email and couldn't find it. Guidelines that we have. They're not on our website. They're not in town code. When you search shoreline guidelines, it doesn't come up. I, I think they're in the uh, design I, standards. I, I, I opened up the design standards and there was a line talking about shoreline guidelines, but it's like it's not there yet or something. You so that if you have them, I don't know where they are. I think Isn't there a design itself that indicates, um, you know, a visual? Yeah, the, I couldn't find it. Uh, yeah, there was that paper we've had in the development office, but as far as digitally available, I can't find it. So do we need to make sure that that is part of what's happening then? Because, um, you know, we're moving towards digital stuff and we're asking our residents to move in that direction with us. And if they don't have full information about especially shoreline or ridgeline guidelines, that would be an opportunity for us to make sure that it's there. You, you got to have it somewhere. I have it permanent. Yeah. Well, the one I look at is yeah. printed. I have and it shows it visually. examples oh, of what you should do. And yeah. So, yeah. They're printed, but I'm saying that. Right. That's what, but it, um, I haven't ever looked. It's criteria. Right. Well, that was my point as I looked yesterday yeah. and I couldn't find it. So we should we need to make it available. Yeah. Yeah. That's important. Well, one of the things about shoreline guidelines that that um, driving around the Westlake Road um, in this last couple of weeks, and I have noticed um, that we have, of course, a lot of new development. We have some, you know, a lot of remodeling going on. There just seems to be a lot of activity there. But talking about the shoreline guidelines and actually the part of the guidelines that maybe we need to either revisit or something uh, because they are already 10 years old and, you know, codes do need to be visited to see 
how we can accommodate what's actually happening. And I'm talking about buffering um, shoreline houses and the fact that the reason why we need to make sure that newer developments are buffered with landscaping and trees and things is because most of the new developments, not, and I'm talking about individual now, uh, single family homes, are painted white. I don't know if you've noticed that, but as an aggregate, it's very striking. And um, so uh, this brings us to that scenic view thing that we've been talking about um, and how we can in, enforce, encourage, I don't know what, we, what you want to call it, but we're getting further away, it seems, from the scenic view that we had intended some time ago. So um, when it comes to shoreline guidelines, we might want to do some kind of review there to see how successful we have been um, with our developments over the last five years or 10 years, however long it's been there, to see if we've actually accomplished anything with it. And if we haven't, okay, then what can we do if we still are going down that road with a scenic view and buffering certain uh, white, you know, very prominent kind of architecture and just talk about that. Joyce, I can say on behalf of the planning board, uh, we have spent more time on shoreline guidelines on a lot of the applications than we do on some of the other issues related to an application. And I would say that we're certainly much more aware and we are more uh, cognizant of, uh, of making sure that the uh, project is, has a visual uh, positive effect from the lake and at, while at the same time allowing the uh, homeowner to have a view of the lake, which is sort of a give and take that we have to go through. But I think uh, we spent a lot of time looking at pictures from the lake at the existing property, uh, determining what existing foliage will remain, what is going to be removed, if any, uh, what is going to be supplemented into the application. Uh, like I said, there's a lot of time spent on it, and and sometimes we sort of go beyond our bounds to make sure that the uh, the applicant does provide a, a favorable uh, impression uh, from the lake. So I, I I think we're working on it. I I I I think this is one situation where it's good to not have subjective regulations uh, as to how the lakefront should look, but more objective. So it's sort of uh, left to the planning board. And the ECB, certainly when they review the plans or anyone else who looks at the plans uh, to provide their input as to what they feel it should look like from the lake and how much vegetation should be involved. So, you know, the other piece of that, well. Uh, but, the, you know, and, and I, I understand that you have given it much more attention, uh, the planning board in recent years, much more attention. And you have, you know, sensitive, um, planning board members um, who recognize, you know, the need for buffering for landscape buffering and things like that because of the scenic views that it, it gives from the lake. Um, but it would, it's interesting just to see sometimes how in the last five or 10, because it takes time for, uh, you know, new landscaping to grow up enough to be able to buffer anything at all. So we've got, you know, we have, you know, 10 years of, of development there and it would be just interesting. I mean, we have pictures, the, um, the NRI team took photos and have had photos in our files of what the shoreline looked like from say East Lake Road, you know? So just the making the comparisons here is what I'm saying. Are we accomplishing what we think we're accomplishing? That's the whole point. Are we, we're doing all of this and I'm sure that, you know, each individual, um, you know, application is, you know, you do your best to do what you can do. So I'm just saying, let, wouldn't it be interesting for us to take a look, at, you know, from a 10 years perspective and see if we actually are accomplishing what we think we're doing? How else will we know if we don't take a look? That's all I'm saying. And if you, you can take a look, you can take your own private look, drive, you know, driving down Westlake Road, but I wonder what it looks like from East Lake Road 
or the middle of the lake. So just refresh our memory here for a quick second. So back to, I think it was 2014, 2015, Tom, you and I actually were part of the Canada Lake Watershed Council subgroup that was supposed to look at the dirty six, the most six most pollutants to Canandaigua Lake, and three of which, one was the septic, one was steep slopes, the other was the shorelines. We never got to shorelines. The committee, the best right. of mine that died, um, that the council, you know, it would, it would help, I think, a lot if the council would lead that effort for all of Canandaigua Lake as opposed to just the town of Canandaigua. But I remember is that some of the stuff I started looking at with our shoreline guidelines, our sh current shoreline guidelines are predominantly aesthetics, it's the yeah. views and stuff, versus I know we got into conversations of some of the preliminary stuff we were talking about, like the bathtub effect, if everybody has uh, retainer walls versus riprap shorelines and those types of things, where I think our guidelines could actually be enhanced a little bit it's going to take an effort and work on them and work through that stuff but there's other things that could be looked at in addition to the scenic aspect and, and in, in fairness when you go around the lake some of the barren lake frontage is homes that have been there for 50 or more years whereas some of the newer ones really have some lovely landscaping because they've been leaned on to do so or to retain that big old willow tree or the yeah. whatever it is to screen the view from the lake. So in landscaping takes time, but I'm thinking of 10 bucks, you know, mm -hmm. that, that big house that stands out. Mm -hmm. That landscape is really very nice and, uh, you know, some of the recent projects have really knocked themselves out. Yeah. Screening it's, their homes, even in tiny lots. So except for except for the White Houses, right, Tom? <laughs> the White Houses you can't be. I'm sorry. <laughs> we try. We try, right? Yeah. I know that, that's the issue. You try. Um, but go, getting back to what Doug just said about shoreline guidelines and the watershed council. Um, and it looks like, you know, in our design criteria, that is the aesthetic model. OK, that we're putting forth to our our applicants. This is the kind of the model, the visual that we would like to see here. But there's a really important thing about, you know, like the engineering and that you get to the riprap and as a, as opposed to, you know, whatever. But there's also steep slopes there. And although we have a steep slope law and a lot of this is in there, there was a concern at the time that shoreline guidelines should also include the kinds of things that the Watershed Council was talking about and that's why the town of candidate with the nri team didn't do anything with shoreline guidelines but maybe you know as the cic we need to come back to the shoreline guidelines and say not only aesthetically but in engin the engineered part of that how how can we now um update that because if the watershed and if we think the watershed council is the the place for it to be looked at or reviewed, implement, you know, make some suggestions, you know, write some kind of uh, model code or whatever for the entire lake, then we should be putting some pressure on the watershed council or something. I mean, uh, somehow, you know, there's a, there's a goal there and a comprehensive plan to do something with shoreline guidelines, just like it did Ridgeline and whatever. So, but that hasn't been accomplished yet. Um, so I'm only making the suggestion that if we want to do something, we should you know, probably figure it out. What the heck do we want to do? And put some pressure on, or not pressure, but indicate to the Watershed Council that we're, you know, they were doing it once, you know, years ago, they thought that was a good idea. Maybe they need to take it up again or not. And then we do our own. I don't know who authored those shoreline guidelines that we have, but they're really very good. It's a matter of how you follow them and enforce them. EDR, EDR wrote those for us when we did the update. Another or, ordinance? I don't think so. Right. I mean, is it good? Oh, it's an guidelines? ordinance. I mean, it's already an ordinance. Those are not just guidelines and say do it or don't. Those are, it is a guideline. It's not a guideline. It's a, it's in code, just like any other thing that we 
have. It's it's code. That's the problem. I think that a lot of uh, we've gotten, you know, kind of saying, oh, well, it's just a guideline. We don't have to. No, it's in code. It's in the design criteria. Okay. It's, and it's sufficient. It's it, it could be. I mean, the, the planning board has, you know, opportunities to do whatever it needs to do with it. But I don't know if residents, when they see guideline, whether they go, oh, well, you know, you know, it, it, this is just a topic here about um, how we need to either uh, finish up the um, goal as I think the NRI team thought that it was going to be taken care of through the watershed council. And if the watershed council doesn't want to take a look at it, then maybe we should finish up with something, uh, you know, take a look at it. Is it sufficient? Then fine, we don't need to do anything. Will it save, you know, shoreline, you know, erosion and have we done enough in that part then then we don't have to do anything but i'm saying there there's no, nothing that says comprehensively uh we've accomplished that goal or we have to make that assessment in some way so what's the next step for developing the plan for next year for the CIC action items and stuff. Is there, I mean, that should be coming up here relatively quickly. It's on the schedule. I'm kind of thinking that our, that just September, September 2nd. Do you mean, I mean, is that waiting too long to start talking about it? Because that would really help. That's when you're doing the strategic plan. Yeah, right. I was yeah. thinking. Yeah. Well, and then this topic, I think, should be one of the points that's discussed during the strategic plan. And then see where everybody's at. But we also need participation from, I mean, we don't even have a quorum here today. So, I mean, we need participation from everybody. We need to see kind of what's going on with the members that haven't been as active. And, 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 and truthfully, Gary, you got to help me. We need to get the town board at the strategic planning session that the CIC is doing so that we know kind of where the <laughs> town board members are at also with this too. It would be very, very helpful. Are so that's September on? 22nd, right? Yeah. yeah. We're inviting yes. all the boards. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Doug, what is a quorum? What, what is our, what is the number for a so quorum? I think it's, but it has to be in the room. What is it, five or six? I counted it up. I think it's five, five. but it has to be in the room. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you're you're not counting then your Zoom participants or yeah. or when I count I count you know six is this not uh, and that's excluding staff is that not excluding staff you can't count the Zoom participants because the emergency order has been lifted so you can participate no problem at all but you don't count towards the quorum the quorum for a committee oh. or a board or anything actually requires the members in the room. Oh, so is a town board member or staff, or is it part of? No, the it's part of the CAC. Okay. So there's four of us. So that's well. Then you know. Then you know. If we're running into problems with quorum, either we're going to have to get you know people who you know like me who are doing this online need to say, hey, wait a minute, you're going to have to get dressed. You're going to have to go down there, put your shoes on, and you're going to have to be there. You're going to, you're going to have a quorum because. You know, well, I was not aware. I don't know if anybody else was, even what our quorum was. So, thank so you. So we just started talking about it in the last couple of weeks with the different boards and stuff when the emergency orders were lifted. So, uh, even with the planning board, I know Chuck, we had that conversation. <coughs> board, I know I had a conversation with Terrence and stuff, and even the town board. We're looking to make a significant. The town board. I talked to them uh, last town board meeting about making significant. Uh, financial investment in the Anna Linda room to um, further allow hybrid efficiency for hybrid meetings, but still the members of the for public involvement participation, but the members still need to be in the room. So, so when, when um, a notice is sent out about a meeting, perhaps in a big line on top, that a quorum consists only of members physically present at the meeting. That'd be a yeah. good reminder. Good reminder for a little one. 
Sir, we had talked about running an ad to try to recruit new members. We did talk about it and we didn't do it. Um, Doug and I were talking about talking to some of the people that have been coming mm -hmm. to. Shouldn't the members be I, I participants of town committees and uh, teams? You know, that's something we talked about repeatedly. Like, we've done it both ways. We've invited the public to join the CIC. Mm -hmm. to right. You. right. Um, we did get another member, but he switched to a different committee. Um, but you're right. I mean, when this committee was started, it wasn't just members of the public. It was people from existing boards. I think, it, I think the original um, CIC members were all members either of previous boards or current uh, or committees, boards or committees, some involvement in the town. Of course, that was the initial one. You know, we needed to start with something. Um, so if that's the situation, we should probably move forward in some way to I think that you did, and, and didn't you kind of have a perspective or prospectus of what you were looking for in a CIC, a new CIC member? Did you do that, um, Doug, on the last time, last round? I mean, this has been now a few years ago before. I think it was a couple of years ago, and I think I'd have to look at what we wrote, but, you know, we sent out a press release and we kind of explained what the CIC is, how it got started, and what their, what the purpose yeah. is. Yeah. I think there should be at least two members from the from the community who are not on other boards because I think it's important that the community know what's going on and like Sal, mm -hmm. you're going to mention it to everybody, all your friends, neighbors, and relatives, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> and get another member like that. Uh, and then, but I, I think it's important to have the other um, committees represented here. One of the original purposes of the CIC was not only the implementation of the comprehensive plan, but the sharing of information back to all the boards and groups. And when we don't have active participation from the various representatives of the various groups, that group is noticeably left out in the cold mm -hmm. and you see it. I've seen it. And the zoning board is a great example of that. Representative doesn't participate. The zoning board isn't getting the information. The zoning board doesn't understand the direction we're going on some of the things because there's not that mm -hmm. continuity of information. So it is uh, critically important that we have representatives from all of our groups and our groups have grown to it. Yeah. You know, we've got these new t project teams that are technically, they report to the CIC, but, you know, I think sometimes we even have to remind them, the tree team, the history team, and all these other teams, that technically they report back to the CIC. Mm -hmm. If they don't, they shouldn't be, you know, just going off on their own, doing whatever it is right. that, you know. Well, I can't be the liaison to all of them. Right. <laughs> you know, right. So right. Um, there is some structural improvements needed. Mm -hmm. Well, Joyce is right. If they begin with each committee designated somebody off that committee to serve on the CIC. Mm. Yeah. yeah. But, but you know, we, we also need to be fair. And when they designate someone, that person should know what they're getting into. Mm -hmm. Because it shouldn't be the new person on the team that is totally unaware of. I'm speaking from experience. Yeah, right. You can't imagine. <laughs> it's like, oh, we don't have somebody from Parks and Rec. Karen. <laughs> That's exactly what happened. <laughs> and the same way I got on the Parks and Rec. Oh, you want a senior group? Well, you're on the Parks and Rec committee. <laughs> you senior? What about uh, looking at something like a quarterly review from the different committees that a representative would come in? You know, talk to let us know what's going on and vice versa. Is that too frequent? Or? No, well, I don't know. So, you know, we meet twice a month and that schedule gets really full really fast. Mm -hmm. and, and I mean, who was it pointed out? The Ag Committee, we don't, you're right, we don't talk about that very much in CIC, but I think it's because that schedule gets filled. And I look at the priority list that we had from our resolution. Um, you know, the year prior and make sure that we're revisiting those items twice a year. And then we still have to have our planning meetings and other stuff. Um, and before you know it, all however many meetings, 24 meetings or whatever, are, are filled. But 
you know, maybe we need to try and, I don't know, rethink it. I'm not sure. Or Well, looking ahead to 2022, I see it as an opportunity to kind of regroup. We've got a new town planner. She can take the lead with CIC. She's going to do the strategic plan, lead that effort for us mm -hmm. in September. And so she'll have direct involvement with the initiatives and the goals and what the CIC is looking for. And so I think it's a natural time, but it's also a time to renew the focus on what exactly it is the CIC is going to be working on. And maybe as part of the strategic planning, it comes out that the CIC wants to look at the structure of itself in addition to some of the company, you know. That's yeah. all the stuff that mm -hmm. Sean will be able to pull out with this with the strategic planning meeting. So you yeah, got your work cut out for you. Yeah. I'm so glad she's here. Like that. <laughs> job, job security. Yeah. yeah. Because our work on the comprehensive plan should be lightening up lighting up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that'll yeah, or, or should be moving on to something else. Right. We're getting heavier because we'll have a we new have a plan. Right. Yeah. Right. 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 A new right. checklist. Right. Another right. checklist. But essentially, okay. you know, the checklist is going to be the same year after year after yeah. year, yeah. plan yeah. after plan. Yeah. Yeah. With with uh, exceptions would be technology advances and uh, and population advances. So. Basically, you know, we're always going to have to protect the water. We're also mm -hmm. uh, always going to have to pay attention to infrastructure. We're going to have to, you know, all this stuff here, we're, we're going to have to pay attention to. So there's basics every year in our goals. But I agree with you. We should take a look at what we can add. And perhaps, you know, every so often, if we see it on the agenda, invite someone from the uh, from another okay. committee to yeah. it. However, today, getting into the ag issue, um, you know, that was unexpected. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, which is how a lot of our meetings yeah. happen. You know, and something you said a minute ago, Sal, you know, you said like a quarterly review, and it makes me think about the joint meetings. Mm -hmm. yeah, yes. I, yeah. I, I, <coughs> we've had them, and we've not had them, mm -hmm. and neither thing seems to work. When we've done the joint meetings, we get complaints from other members of other groups that we never get anything done. People, it's just the same people showing up. But so maybe That's the way the we were doing same it, people show up. Maybe the way we were doing it yeah. needs to be changed. But I still think it's valuable because I feel like we have a lot of great conversations in here, but sometimes it doesn't spill over. Right. right. I'm getting back to the goals for the CIC and how we st uh, structure our schedule uh, in the new comprehensive plan the, you know, the goals and strategies are now um, departmentalized into specific topics, 11 topics. And this is going to help us, you know, to kind of streamline our overview. If we were to put, you know, the topic um, as on our schedule for review, all we would have to do is just go down and see, you know, like who, what, what are we working on particularly in that? And that would kind of help us to focus what our um, meetings would be focused on. You know what I'm saying? Right That's now- The year was done, but obviously it means that some things got left off the schedule because they weren't a priority for this year. Yes, that's true. But I guess what I'm saying is that we're going to go through those strategies and we're going to say, OK, fine. And one of our when we start working on our our plan, you know, our uh, project plan, and we're going to go through each one of those categories, those 11 categories that we have, we're going to say, yeah, th think we could do this this year. think we can do well, we're going to have to do a committee for that. Week. But what I'm saying is that it is that there's a, from my point of view, I see a structure there that um, will help to guide us uh, and instead of like we've done with our, you know, other um, priorities, ranking our priorities and things like that. We, you know, the, there was like natural resource protection, mixed use overlays, strength and conservation efforts, update, you know, they were just topics all over the place. It's hard to then put those into a schedule and to know who's going to be responsible, but this way, I think we're. I think we've done ourselves a good favor, actually, about structuring our goals and strategies in a way that's going to help us keep on track. The question will be, you know, can you actually talk about everything in a year, 
or do you yeah. have yeah, that's true. That's, you know, that's 12 meetings right there just to review each one of those. Right. Mm. And then you don't have time to review them again, either that or you right. other things out. Yeah. Absolutely. If you're going to review everything on a quarterly basis or even in a, you know, biannual or something like that, it's, or, you know, whatever. Um, it's, yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot of work. I do mm -hmm. like that the planning meeting is separate from a scheduled CIC meeting. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah. yeah, that's true. Other people involved in other groups. Is this is this something that should be brought up at our September meeting? Saying, "Hey, guy, you know, really the troops or whatever you want to call it." Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna start rolling it out, pushing it out too. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Sean's got her work cut out for her. <laughs> <laughs> so are all of the groups going to be involved with the strategic planning or was it just no yes. we invited them all everyone oh, invited so them all. It's be a crowd it will be a yeah. crowd that's why we're doing what crouch hall right yeah, yeah. Crouch. yeah it hasn't we haven't sent an email to all the other committees yet but I'm going to put on my report. We put a too, save the right? data. I yeah. put a save the data. There's a yeah. save the data. I'm going to put on my town board report too. And then I specifically sent to the town board too, asking them to participate. But okay. And it's far enough out too. You know, right. Away. Right. right. I can talk to all the busy day and I'm So are you asking times. all of the members of all of the boards or yes. all of the oh, yeah, right. We have to represent If you don't, then people will assume somebody else is going to go in there. Okay. Well, you need the input of everybody to know what the collective direction sure. is mm -hmm. because, and we've seen it so many different times where somebody is very passionate about an issue, mm -hmm. but the rest of the group isn't necessarily in that same direction about That's whatever, okay. and okay. specifically the town board. And so if the town board is not supportive of some of these directions, you know, and, and I'm going to say this, and I've said it, you know, Gary's sitting right here and I've said it before, it's almost like we need to out help lead the town board this is what the collective group of 60 to 100 people are saying these are the priorities mm -hmm. town board we need you to come along this journey with us okay. mm -hmm. so the town board will be there too i, don't know. I can't short of They're going, going to their invited. houses and dragging right. them out yeah. i will try my best and they'll listen <laughs> they should be an active participant i think they've always tended to bash i mean what do we have in the joint meetings most yes does it most need to be a special town board yes meeting? we will advertise it as yes. are you also thinking about giving these people credit for that meeting that uh, has to earn so much well, credit? Oh, credit somebody did i think joyce asked that or something that's right that's idea. not a bad idea that's yeah. it's an extra incentive yeah I get, you only need training credit if you're training for something, right? Well, planning zoning planning board zoning and ECB required. are actually all required to get four hours per year. Yeah, it's a big burden. I see, I see, did you say? Four. Which ones? Planning board, zoning board, and ECB. Oh, ECB. We should I'm make the Parks and Rec Committee because they need no. it sometimes. <laughs> I'm the saying. Town board. Oh, yes. do they really? <laughs> I don't think so. We have Could you say that again a little louder, please? <laughs> the town board should as well. There's no re no requirement of educational requirements for the town board. Oh, are you serious? Don't tell them that. Well, <laughs> it, it's appalling. Don't tell the some, candidates. Some of them participate more than others do, and it's obvious which is which. Yeah. Hmm. This is all recorded. You know? Yes. <laughs> I have a contract for 25. I'm good. <laughs> and even though a lot of those trainings get repetitious, is right, Gary? You, you, you learn some really good stuff by going to those training sessions. I've been to so many, and I always pick up at least one yeah. thing. Mm -hmm. At yeah. least one. Yeah. <laughs> Hmm. And you mix with some of the people that get the same issues. Sure. Right? There's always highlighting and uh, and uh, different color uh, fonts you can use and emails. Yes. 
we should be closing, but anyway, thinking I just this, looked at this, the time. <laughs> this watershed council in shoreline guide, guidelines, it should be a lakewide thing. Yeah. And yeah. another yeah. issue that should be focused on is the dark sky compliant issue, which I think our town is falling down as far as enforcement goes. And you look around the lake, the <coughs> incredibly bright lights. I don't know what, whether we can ever correct that, but some communities have done a wonderful job. We have code. It lands on. I know we have, we've got code, but we have code. no, we, we don't update the lighting code and everything. Yeah. We do enforce That's it. Right. So here's the thing: we enforce it up to the issuance of the certificate of occupancy. Yeah. But then when somebody changes something out, or the existing, yeah, it's, the only thing we can do is on a complaint yeah, basis. Yeah. And then, but there's no awareness of it, unfortunately. But are we the only lake um, ac lake access municipality that does that? because I attended a city planning board meeting about something that's supposed to take place on the city pier. And they were talking about having very large, um, whatever they call them, the high, high, the really bright lights in this particular area, which I quietly pointed them out that people go on the city pier at night to sit in neck and they don't wanna be all, well, you know, they do that. They do that. Yeah, they do that. <laughs> Honestly, they do that, and sometimes they do more than that. Um, <laughs> but that. my point is, it pretty stuff. much landed on deaf ears. You know, so I'm I'm wondering if other municipalities, like the city, like Gorham, like sure. Well, everybody's code is different, right? Things. But dark sky compliant generally means generally, and this is over generalization, that the light doesn't shine up in the air, right? So it could be very, very bright and still shine down and still be dark sky compliant. I think the city is probably aware of dark sky. I mean, look at all the work that they did with their when they redid Kershaw Park and their, their um, you know, their lighting on the streets and everything. It, that's all dark sky compliant. Whether it gets into every application or not, you know, that's the question. I, I agree. But for my house, I can see Pacto at night. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure. I, well, I'm so, surprised. You know, you know, some of the dealerships too at night. Um, and I think that's one of the main issues as you come into 332 into Uptown is the lighting is, is we come over that little hill and, you know, we're not dark sky compliant. We could probably have a whole meeting on lighting issues. Yes, we could. <laughs> um, it is 1030 and I do have a question. You know, we talked about stormwater stuff and then things today, you know, I, I wrote some notes on my paper that talking about the um, the sucker book projects. Mm -hmm. Is it something that the CIC or drainage committee or whoever should be making a recommendation to work on a project next year? Or is that the count watershed council? Well, the town board is the one that has to authorize it, but it's basically, I think that if the CIC wanted to make a recommendation that they continue to support the Sucker Brook Water Quality Improvement Projects and just kind of a generalization like that, and then leave it to the town board and the watershed manager to figure out specifically which ones are the most appropriate. Because I always think about well, what actual action can we take? And some of these other things, it's a little more vague, but that's something, yeah. yeah, this is a good idea. But, but we can't a, actually make a recommendation to the town board because we don't have a quorum. I don't That's mean true. right now, but you know, through a resolution. Well, when you get the city involved too, since they're benefited from it, they've already paid. Okay, they've already paid. We've already paid. Yes, yeah, so we both already put money. The money we sitting there. The money in the about the future. I thought. Well, the for the six projects that are left, that was the money. That's the money that's there, and so we've actually, Kevin. Uh, it's been paperwork for us, but. Kevin has basically been able to match almost dollar for dollar that we jointly put in with grant money. Yeah. So it's really oh, extended really yeah. it's really the money that Good we have. example of intermunicipal cooperation mm -hmm. and yep. thank God for Kevin to yep. getting more and, money. And even when we did the County Road 30 project back here, I mean, it was actually, I thought it was cool to see when we were actually doing the work, 
there was one day a town bulldozer was operating back there and I stopped because I didn't recognize the truck. And it was actually one of the city employees who was working using the town. I mean, so it was a complete mm -hmm. joint project, not only the financial, but also the labor. Should the, um, the CIC be including a report in the um, town board um, uh, agenda? Be welcome. Report. There's but a spot for it. That's why they for the past couple of years, we've done the annual. <laughs> Yeah. Says, that, that uh, okay, we'll just put out here. There, there is a spot for it. I mean, as the chair, I guess it's me that dropped the ball and you never sent it. But, okay. but I mean, it doesn't have to be much like some bullet points, you yeah. know. I don't take I notes. I think it is an important issue. I do. Gary will take it to the town board. We have we have to put a couple of reports in yeah. when I had time to write them, but it does not happen often enough. I agree. Uh, Here's another question. I'm very really, really serious about this. Does anybody read all those reports? I think they do. Sometimes. Yeah, I think they do. And sometimes, honestly, do I wish to record whatever? Sometimes I put stuff in my report specifically to see whether or not they read see it. See whether they read it. Because mm -hmm. I read every bit. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and if we had sure someone to take actual minutes or someone who had time to sit down and write out the notes, we could stick our meeting notes in there as a report. The yeah. ordinance committee does that. You know, they just stick their minutes right in there. But people think no one's volunteered, that. and I just don't have time to yeah, write out the minutes I understand. and type them and put them in every month. So honestly, that's why it doesn't happen. I'm, I'm amazed you're even here. I don't prioritize it enough. But, but yes, there should be a report. We get our once a year, our resolution that goes to the town board that talks about what we've worked yes. on, what we want yes. to work on next year is our unofficial annual report. Okay. Maybe I think it's an opportunity that we can improve the CMC number. Have I do this over? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say anything about numbers. <laughs> no. <laughs> Um, I don't know where that sleeps us with the shoreline guidelines. I wrote a bunch of notes there too, but there's nothing with answers or points. As Joyce pointed out, they're in the they're, there. they're in code, even though they're called guidelines. And like you said, Joyce, yeah. is it working? Yeah, it all depends on who looks at it. Or well, we, you know, photographs are pretty objective, uh, but you know, got to get someone to take the pictures. I know that when the NRI team had pictures of uh, East Lake Road over to the west side, um, you know, we got those from people that lived on that on East Lake Road. So, they're, you know, it's just just kind of checking ourselves to see if we're going in the right direction. That's all we can change. We can change, you know, around if everything around, if it's not looking the way that we envisioned and maybe our envisioning needs to change too. Um, just, you know. Um, I have a question. Yeah. Um, just, as we wrap up, I just opened up the schedule to check and for our next meeting, we're scheduled to talk about Gateway Signage Committee. I know Oksana couldn't come today, but they have been busy and they have been working. So I'll be able to update us on where they're at with that. Right, we're meeting tomorrow. again tomorrow. Okay. Yeah, I have a question yeah. for Doug from uh, the signage committee, something that we talked about. Um, and that is where, what is the disposition of the town board and Lamar and what can the signage committee expect from either that deliberation or outcome or whatever? So uh, it's just, I guess what I would say is that the conclusion of that would have nothing at all to do with the gateway sign right. nor any impact on the gateway signs. Um, so I would start with that. And then uh, in terms of the outcome of any settlement associated with that remains to be seen. Uh, at this point, as of right now, I would have to say that I would ask the town board to once again continue the local law because I'm not getting information that I need. But again, it doesn't have any impact at all on the gateway stuff. Right. 
Okay, uh, we can, Sal and I will relay that then to right. the team. Right. Yeah. Hearing something, maybe not, no, we're, you know, we're gonna collaborate. Okay, so, all right. I, I would say no collaboration. Uh, I would say that's off the table. In terms of with the gateway team, the gateway team would be the signage coming into the community, mm -hmm. no collaboration yep. at all. Okay, good. And then the other the other thing is is the um, the LDC and the wayfinding signs. Um, you know, we have a sign that we thought we would put up as you come from the city into the uptown, but wayfinding signs may include something like that. That would be another issue that we have. Uh, but are we anywhere? close to wayfinding design or not? So, um, okay, so wayfind again, that's not gateway. I think you guys are truthfully yeah, kind of getting off the reservation here a little bit. Um, no, we're not. No, we're not, Doug, because we we think that there should be a gateway sign on North Road coming into Uptown. That is all part of the corridor, which we thought are they're talking about gateway or uh, wayfinding signage, because what we saw in the presentation for that was a, a a large sign that indicated this is uptown, you know, this is, so that's what we're asking. If there's not going to be a wayfinding sign in that area, then we can go and move forward with, you know, a design that we think would be appropriate. I would avoid anything to do with uptown because the LDC is actually hired Bergman to do wayfinding signage jointly for uptown, downtown, and the lakefront. Mm -hmm. yes. and so that's all moving forward on that. And I believe that, uh, you know, there might even be an opportunity to fund the construction of that wayfinding signage. Everybody okay. will have a chance to have input on it, but I don't think you guys need to worry about the design of that right now anyway. Oh, when, I, when I'm talking about design, the, the design, the a particular design, but there is coloration and things like that that we would love to, to know what their color things are doing. Okay. So it's, I, I don't think it's anywhere near any of that. And again, the, the goal is to make the wayfinding signage match so that somebody coming into the community is looking for the same type of signs, whether they're in the town or the city. Joyce and Sal, maybe we just tell the committee tomorrow that maybe that one you hold off on if you want it to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, happen. that's the kind of the direction that we were thinking, are we? Okay. <laughs> if, if anything, if there's going to be a sign there and if the wayfinding team is or whoever Bergman is going to place a sign there, fine, then we don't need to worry about it. And if they're not, then we'll we can do. That's great. Good. Yeah. We'll eliminate we to uh, familiar territory from a few years ago with an almost two-hour meeting. So <laughs> we we'll probably need to wrap up, but um, yeah. So we'll cover that since the meetings tomorrow. We'll go over what you guys come up with next <laughs> meeting, um, and then we can look and focus on the September twenty-second meeting and try and share information among our other groups and committees and project teams and get people excited about coming to that meeting too. Right. Sit right. On the teams. Yeah. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Nice. Thanks, Chuck. Bye all. See you, Chuck. Bye.